everybody thanks for joining us uh really interesting times right now um so glad everyone's joining online since this is really the only way we can do this right now really appreciate everybody's time and hopefully you will learn something from this presentation and we'll have a really good discussion so a little bit about me before uh we go into it so uh, yeah, currently I work at LinkedIn, um, but my journey to product management uh, was uh, through several different steps. So initially I actually started as a uh, AmeriCorps fellow, so working in nonprofits. Uh, and then I quickly uh, started uh, working at a, uh, an ad tech startup. And then from there moved more into engineering uh, where I started working in a uh, engineering slash hybrid PM role um the very small startup at that point and then moved towards a pm and senior pm role uh at sergo which was an ed tech company and uh currently working as a pm on the growth team at linkedin and i put a couple hobbies here like playing music uh like traveling not right now though uh and you know doing all that doing all that fun stuff so at linkedin what do i work on uh, so I work on the my network team and our mission is to help members connect to the right people so that they can build the right network to help them be productive and successful. So uh, if you open LinkedIn right now, uh, you could go to the my network tab and see some of the things that we've been working on. Uh, we like to bring the best recommendations for members so that they can connect to the right people, right interests uh, and build out that graph uh, for their professional network. All right, so the agenda for today is talking about what makes a good growth PM. Uh, and want to make sure that this is, uh, you know, this isn't actually just specific to growth product managers, but uh, ideally for all product managers uh, in general, really just picking growth here because uh, of the role I'm in right now, but also uh, some of the key nuances about uh, being a growth PM versus a uh, general PM. Uh, so the agenda that we're going to go through is, first of all, what is even a growth team, right? Uh, defining what that is, uh, and then defining what a growth PM is in the context of the growth team and then product management together, and then jumping into the meat of it. So the four different points I want to talk to today is what makes a good growth PM. A uh, gro good growth PM is an ecosystem thinker, uh, one that can think broadly about uh, the implications and uh, you know changes that one makes in one's product and how it relates to the rest of the product ecosystem. Good growth PM is a data-driven decision maker. We have so many decisions that we need to make on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, tons of emails, tons of messages. How do we make the right choices? How do we build? Uh, how do we make the decisions uh, to how to pick the right things to build? Um, and that's through data. Third, uh, a good growth PM is an experiment-driven learner. Uh, so through experimentation and through uh, operational excellence and experimentation, uh, learning uh, the, what needs to be learned in, or, in, order, in order to uh, uh, build the right product. And then finally, being a crystal clear communicator of vision. So that's our agenda for today. Go one second, having some issue. Okay, got it. All right, so let's start with what is a growth team. So one of my favorite, uh, uh, one of the, my favorite bloggers, or I guess he's actually a growth uh, expert in the field, is Andrew Chen. So if you haven't heard of him, uh, it's worth looking up his blog, subscribing to his newsletter. He's a great. Uh, he writes a ton of great posts. Used to be the growth lead for uh, Uber. Uh, I think he puts it really succinctly that. Um, it's not actually true that if you build a good product, you know, people will just come and start using it. Uh, there needs to be a very deliberate approach to uh, growing usership, uh, retaining members. And so I really like this way that uh, he has put the definition of what a growth team is. Product growth and a growth team is the discipline of applying the scientific method to business KPIs and just overall metrics. And it provides an underlying system for increasing the metrics whether that's revenue, acquisition, retention, engagement, or any other metrics for that matter. So over here on the right is another really good source, Reforge. Definitely check them out. Uh, they also uh, do a ton of really good writing and uh, courses on, on growth. 
but some examples of you know who might even be on a growth team are the growth PM, the engineers, uh, growth marketer, data analysts, uh, and so on. So uh, really what a growth team is about is being deliberate and disciplined in uh, optimizing impact and driving impact uh, for the product ecosystem. So continuing on to this point, uh, some of you may have already seen this in the past where uh, I think they're called pirate metrics. I think it's just because it's R. So uh, kind of the old school way of thinking about growth was through this funnel view, which is, you know, first you have uh, users that you acquire in the funnel. Then after they've uh, been acquired through email or some kind of source, you have to activate them somehow. So get them signed up through the onboarding flow. Uh, only once they're activated can they start using the product and then uh, be retained in the product ecosystem, uh, start actually uh, you know, building relationships on the app or starting using it in a way that is meaningful to them. Uh, and then if it's a more business oriented product, uh, how, can, uh, how can that business generate revenue uh, based on that retention and user engagement. So that's kind of the old school way of thinking about it. Um, but another way to think about it that's been getting more popular now is loops. So funnels versus loops. Uh, so instead of it just being a step-by-step -step funnel, uh, each of these steps actually plays into each other and compounds on top of each other. So uh, a good example here is one of the Pinterest uh, user and growth loop where you start with a new user and once they sign up, they start getting activated by generating content. They start pinning things, they start sharing pins. Uh, and then that leads them into the retention phase, which is that number three over here, where they're saving, repinning, and, and doing more for the uh, overall Pinterest ecosystem. And then th those pins in turn start getting indexed uh, on search engines. So if you search on Google for an image, a lot of the times now, uh, it takes you to a pin that then takes you to that board and then there's more pins under it. And if you're not a Pinterest user, uh, that will then uh, prompt you to sign up to be a Pinterest user. And so the cycle continues, right? So uh, another way to think about growth teams are uh, through these two models. Uh, they're not, you know, they're not uh, mutually exclusive. Sometimes they go hand in hand, but the funnel view and loop view are the most uh, popular views of this. So for me, if I, if I had to put it into a one sentence to me, growth equals driving impact for your product and overall business ecosystem. Uh, I wanna just take a pause there. I can't see any of you. Uh, usually I like to look at the crowd, um, but uh, if there are any questions out there, wanna pause. And I think Vina, you're gonna look through the- Yeah, we don't have any questions yet. So feel free to oh. proceed, but I'm also making sure that they're able to hear and uh, you know, see your screen. Yeah. Uh, can we confirm that right now, just in case they yeah, can Yeah, I agree. Um, <laughs> yes, they are able to see you. And uh, somebody did confirm that it's great so far. So thank you for oh, that. That's good. So they can hear me as well. Yep. Is, okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah, and this is new for all of us. I, I really usually enjoy, uh, you know, seeing, seeing uh, people in the crowd. But uh, yeah. All right. So moving on. So then we just defined what a growth team is. And again, you should feel free uh, after this. A lot of these slides are more prompts for, for you to go out and also search for some of these things because there's so much good uh, material out there written about growth teams. And it's definitely not just those two slides that define what a growth team is. Um, similarly with this uh, slide as well. So since we Can defined- I, um, stop yeah. you and ask you a question? There was one actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. How did you decide to get into growth versus another area at LinkedIn? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. Um, like even just hearing that question, I remember the moment when, uh, you know, I could actually, uh, I was deciding between different teams. Uh, we're gonna get into this a little bit. So the reason I got into growth specifically is because I think the way I'll put it is just, uh, I think the rigor, uh, and that's not to say that product management fields uh, don't have uh, a type of rigor, like a quantitative rigor to them, um, but just based on what I knew about growth teams and uh, a lot of the exciting work that they've done um, in the past. So some of the famous quote unquote growth teams of the past are, things, are, are teams like the Uber growth team or the uh, Airbnb growth team. 
Uh, a lot of these teams, uh, there's lots of you know stories about them out there. So A, I would say it's the rigor and also the excitement of uh, coming up with new products and ideas that are solely for the sake of uh, driving uh, a better user experience. Uh, but again, so the, that doesn't exclude general product management, of course, um, uh, as, as, as we'll, we'll outline here. Cool. Any other questions? Okay, there's before? another question. Um, right. Somebody cool. wanted to know if you can give another example of loop. It wasn't very clear. Like in your previous slide, oh, yeah, I think yeah. you were mentioning, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, because there's, I mean, there's like oodles and oodles of uh, examples. And the first one that comes off to the top of my head is actually one that I uh, encountered recently, which on Airbnb, once you have, uh, so once you've uh, done a booking, uh, it prompts you. So let's say I'm the guest and I've just gone through the, uh, I just finished my trip. Um, so before I can see the, uh, the rating that the other person has uh, made for me, so the host, I have to actually put in a rating and then I, uh, then I can see the rating that they put for me, right? So there's this incentive there. And then Airbnb listings are listed higher in search indices if they have higher ratings. So it's literally like they know that they need to get more ratings on individual uh, listings for those listings to show on search indices. So uh, in order to do that, they prompt me to put in my review first. And then let's say someone who's brand new to Airbnb or is just looking to travel uh, searches for something in Google. It's like, hey, I want to go to Columbia. That listing will show uh, closer to the top now because of the ratings that, uh, that I gave. So it's instead of being like, hey, once you're in the Airbnb ecosystem, there's no way for uh, people in that in the retention phase to help acquire more people in the future, uh, more users in the future. But uh, the loop view is a way to integrate everything together. So, uh, I mean, there's literal, we could go through uh, weeks on just talking about loops. Uh, but yeah, thanks for that question. Cool. And another follow-up to that was, how do you convert existing funnels to loops? Uh, sorry, what was that? How, oh, do you, well, how do you convert existing funnels to loops? Yeah, so I think that's something that is, uh, that's a tough question. So I think with each of those phases, so just going back here, right? Like once you've activated someone, so like, it, I think the, the key is to ask in each of these steps, what additional steps can we uh, provide for our users? So one thing that's just, that just comes to mind, for example, is once you've activated, right, let's say you're going through the onboarding flow, uh, something that's really popular now is, hey, if you invite five more people to this, then you, uh, you, know, you get like $5 credits for Lyft, right? Um, or like DoorDash or something like that. So even before someone has gone through the whole funnel, uh, of being activated and then be, even before they're retained, they are now another uh, uh, source of more acquisitions, right? So like inherent in that is like a loop there. Whereas if you were just thinking as a funnel, it's like, okay, these people, are, these people are in the activation stage, that's all they're gonna do. We need to get them into the retention phase. But instead of that, it's like, hey, we can loop back to the previous step. So um, yeah, it's really, it's uh, it's cool. I think I think there's like tons of, ideas that haven't even been thought of yet of how to integrate all the different parts of the loop that, you know, in products that we haven't even seen yet. Uh, cool. Okay. I'm going to continue on just for the sake of time, but thanks so much for these questions. These are great. Uh, so, okay. So what is even a growth PM, right? So I think everybody knows and loves this diagram. It's everywhere at this point, every product manager has a tattoo of it. Uh, this like three prong uh, Venn diagram of like a product manager sits between business technology and the customer, which is very true. Um, but if I were to define what the difference between a product manager and a growth product manager is, is that plus a little bit more, uh, as I mentioned, rigor uh, in uh, experimentation, as we'll discuss more in a bit, and a little bit more data driven. And the reason is because of this. Instead of owning a specific product, a growth product manager is focused on driving measurable impact uh, across the board. So uh, they're often more horizontal and they're a lot, often more systems driven in nature. 
and always asking themselves the question, how can we drive impact and how can we drive more impact? Uh, again, this is not exclusively a growth product manager thing, um, but uh, yeah, just in my past experience working on things like an ed tech product where it was more about uh, a real deeper focus, let's say on uh, the experience of uh, how does a teacher go in and create a course, right? It's less, an experience like that is less, uh, a product management product space like that is less so uh, about driving impact than a growth product manager uh, role would be. But uh, yeah, lots of caveats, of course, but uh, it's moving forward. So, all right, so then now that we've defined what a growth team is and we've kind of laid out what a growth product manager is, what makes a good growth product manager? So to me and to the teams I've worked on, uh, this is really four things. Uh, it's being an ecosystem thinker, uh, being a data-driven decision maker, and being an experiment-driven learner. And number four really wraps up all of that. So um, one, two, three are great, but if you can't crystally clearly communicate your vision, uh, then you know, you're really on your own. So uh, those are all the really important things there. All right. So let's start with ecosystem thinking. So uh, the really, the important thing about being an ecosystem thinker is knowing your why and where you lie in the whole ecosystem, right? So some of the questions to ask oneself is what, what is your team's problem space, right? So, you know, you, you're working with the engineering team, you're working with the designers, you're building these exciting products, but like, what is the problem space? What is the problem that you're trying to solve? Uh, and then how does that problem fit into the entire broader ecosystem? And then the really, the fun part is how does that, uh, how does solving that problem contribute to the overall ecosystem, right? So I'll start by giving my example. So as the product manager on the My Network team, uh, as I mentioned, our mission is to help uh, members connect to the people and the things that matter most to them so that they can have a successful uh, professional network and uh, become more uh, become more productive and successful, right? So for me, if I help solve that problem space, what that means is more people will connect to other people on the on the site. Uh, they'll connect to more interests, and that in turn builds out the overall economic graph, as we call in the, in the as part of the LinkedIn ecosystem. And then that in turn provides the data for the sales navigator, for the hiring platform. Uh, you know, now recruiters have more insight into the things that I care about, uh, the people that I talk to. Um, the, the learning team has insight into what kind of subjects and skills uh, do I care about and what kind of things can they predict that I'll care about in the future. Uh, so that's how I would think about the overall ecosystem. So just continuing on to that. So what happens once you do understand where your team fits into the overall ecosystem, right? Well, then now you get to see and identify the gaps uh, and really what gaps are, are opportunities, right? So if you've identified who, you know, how your team fits in and uh, you know, how you contribute, then you can start to see, wait, there are opportunities to uh, fill in uh, the gaps where we could drive more impact. As I mentioned in the earlier slides, you're constantly asking yourself, how can I drive more impact? So one example here is on the feed, we, we realized that there was a gap of getting to uh, more discovery experiences from the feed. And uh, the only way to really do this at scale right now uh, is on the My Network page, right? And so we thought, hey, there's a gap in opportunity to drive people from the feed to do more discovery onto our page. And so we created this discover more link that then takes us to our page uh, and provides more opportunities for members to follow things and connect to things and really uh, align with our, our team's mission of helping people uh, connect to the people and things that they care about. So being an ecosystem is a really important part of being a good growth PM. Uh, gonna pause there, any questions or thoughts? No questions as of now. Awesome, thank you. That's actually just an excuse to drink water. Appreciate it. Cool. All right. So, point number two on what makes a good data driven a, a good uh, growth PM is being a data driven decision maker. So, as I mentioned in the in the earlier slides, there are just so many things and ideas to be working on features, right? 
uh, let's just look at this, uh, this flow chart on the right. You know, um, for those of you that are out there that are product managers, uh, actually that's also something that I do miss about um, the in-person is you can often see who, who what kind of roles people uh, are working on. We often have a lot of data people in the crowd, we have designers, uh, but for those of you who are familiar with uh, the overall product management uh, life cycle, generally something like this, right? You have an idea, you're like, oh, this is really cool. We really want to build this feature. Um, or, you know, maybe another team comes to you and says, uh, we want to do an integration uh, with, your, with your pillar team. Uh, should we build it? I don't know. Uh, and so there, there are many different ways to address this kind of thought. Uh, sometimes it might just be so exciting that you want to build it, right? But really the best way to do this and the most, the really the rigorous way to do this is to do it through data. So um, the first point here is as a good growth product manager, you want to have this DIY skill on your own and do this rough sizing by yourself first um, so that you kind of, uh, I was going to say intuitively, but it's more of like a data intuition. The more you do this, the more uh, data intuitive you become. Uh, you want to do a sizing to even say, hey, is this even worth doing? Is there any impact to doing this, right? So this is a super rough sketch of an idea of how you might do that. So let's say there's an initiative. We want to uh, create some kind of module on the page. Uh, we first have to drill down and see, you know, like what are the total page views? Is it for certain devices? What's the click-through rate on that module? Do we even know that? Is there data for that already? Is there an experiment that has taught us that already? all these different uh, questions that you can ask yourself uh, in order to get the answer with a little bit more precision before even writing a single line of code. Uh, at the end of the day, everything is costly. There are gonna be engineers that have to build this. So the sooner you can do this, the more accurately you can do this, the better. So another thing is uh, what other user research, so more qualitative uh, data can you incorporate? Uh, and just as you keep building uh, features and products, you learn new things you get new pieces of data and then those can then power the next experiments that you, uh, that you drive. So being a data-driven decision maker is very important uh, so that you can have uh, the right information backing up your decisions. And then once you've made the decisions, you really gotta have a lot of focus. Uh, there's always more that could be done. There's always more that could be built, but applying laser focus and ruthless prioritization um, this makes the decision stage all the more important because uh, once you've made that decision, you want to have confidence that you made that decision with the right data so that you don't end up with something that looks like this on the right. Uh, your roadmap should not look like this. Uh, it's very easy to, I would have done like a show of hands of, you know, how many of you have had a roadmap like this in the past? Uh, probably a lot of you, uh, only to have to um, go through it and then delete like 80% of it because you just don't have the capacity, time, or uh, resources to build all those things. So um, the driven helps make the decisions and then helps you focus because you have confidence in the decisions that you made because of the data. Uh, and the last thing to add here is there's this awesome book called The One Thing uh, where the, the author Gary Keller focuses on uh, the idea that you should, you should really at any given time just have one priority and do it really well uh, this could be on your to-do list. This could be, you know, a quarterly goal or something like that. And too often uh, we get caught up in just trying to do everything that we don't do anything well. Um, so, yep, that's uh, just a book recommendation if you're interested in, uh, in that kind of school of thought. Uh, any, any questions? Yeah, we do have a question. Uh, with the ideas that you just presented, um, can you give an example of the data points that you would use to test it? Um, she's saying it makes sense in theory, but whenever I have ideas thrown at me by my executives, I really know where to start immediately. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So I'll try to use this example first. So a, to be more concrete, uh, we can actually just like, let, let's actually think about what numbers we would need to know before pursuing an idea like this. Right. So on the feed on the left side, how, first of all, Stepping back, how many people even see the feed daily, right? And out of those, how many are unique visitors, let's say, right? And then out of those, how many scroll down far enough to see this module, uh, the side module? 
um, it's probably some drop off already, right? So that is already our first layer of addressable, uh, our total addressable market for that. So from there, what proxies do we have for click through rates uh, for CTAs on this panel? Um, as you can see, there's tons of there's tons of buttons, right? Uh, it's not terribly pleasant, but out of those, we we do have a sense of what the click through rate is, and we can apply that to uh, the idea of adding a new one, right? And this was actually a module that existed in a different form before, so we had that data. Uh, so I think having the the tracking data is really important. Um, and if you don't have that, you can use. I mean, honestly, you can just use uh, different proxies that you know, like maybe even exist in the industry. Uh, if the issue is about um, communicating to your exec, right? Uh, and then once you get that, uh, click the rate for that. How many people land on this page? Uh, what is the potential impact we can drive in terms of number of follows on a daily basis, on a weekly basis? And then what does that number of follows mean for the entire ecosystem, right? So just doing that exercise in like 10, 15 minutes, you can get a rough sense of whether this is even something worth pursuing. And when you're talking with your execs or anyone in the meeting, uh, you have that number ready. And it really is about confidence at the end of the day, because if you have that number and you know you did the calculations and this DIY uh, back of the envelope calculation, it gives you confidence uh, to, to, uh, to provide your take using data. So um, yeah, I, ho I hope that answered the question. Um, because I think it was like a two-part question, uh, but yeah. Anything so, else? Yeah. Um, when you push back and say no to the idea of noise, how do you know? How do you do that without getting a bad rep as a killjoy or somebody who puts down all the ideas? Yeah, that's actually that's actually such a good question. Um, there was a there's a slide in here actually that actually it's I guess I put focus on saying no, but. Saying no is probably one of the, and this is something that I personally am trying to continue to build on. Saying no is probably one of the most um, like important things about being a product manager. Uh, and I mean, it's a, it's a great responsibility, right? Because like you have uh, so much responsibility to say yes and no to decisions that saying no is something that is just going to happen more and more. It's going to happen more and more as you you know proceed in your in your career, right? So, to answer the question, um, at least from my experience, if you're able to say no in a way that is a backed up with data, as mentioned here, and is truly focused on solving the problem, and it's really clear that you as a product leader are focused on saying on, on saying no because you're so focused on does this actually help? Is this actually addressing the problem? And here's my work to, to show that I've thought about it, right? Then it's really difficult for anyone to call you a killjoy because it'd be one thing if you were saying no because you're just a jerk, right? But if you are saying no as just a natural byproduct of having done all of this work, it speaks for itself. Um, I mean, yeah, really good question. Um, something that I personally am anticipating that will just continue through the rest of my career is something that you just have to do. Uh, so yeah, cool. If there's no other questions, uh, let's, let's keep going. Cool. So the, cool. So the next, the next, uh, so this is the third point, right? Being an experiment driven learner. So we've talked about being an ecosystem thinker. So you've identified all these pieces uh, of opportunities. You are a very data driven uh, thinker and decision making uh, product manager. Uh, how do you actually learn? So the operational part of learning is through experiments. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with this uh, diagram on the right. But it's a great mental model to have around um, any questions that you have around your own product space, but even in life, actually, to be honest. So <clears throat> you have your known knowns, right? Things that I definitely know that I know. Um, you actually have unknown knowns, too. So those are like things that you actually know that you don't realize, you know. So I think it's like intuition and stuff like that. But what we're focused on here are known unknowns. So what do you know that you that you don't know. So just to be more clear, what questions do you want to answer, right? Uh, and out of those, what are the biggest questions that you want to answer? 
And so even that in itself is a difficult thing to do and, re and requires a lot of discipline and rigor. Uh, what are the biggest assumptions that you have around your product that you want to uh, that you want to validate or learn about, right? So the the example I have here um, is something that, uh, as part of the my network team, a question that I have, which is, what is the value of following someone who is a you know who's a very uh, very uh, active person on LinkedIn? What's the value of that to me and to the ecosystem? versus following a company that you know posts once in a while uh but is a company that i care about right and in this case the company is actually a publisher so that that's just like another layer uh so that's a question that i really want to know right and why do i want to know this so this is where the like is this a biggest assumption or is this not a big assumption well if i figure this out if our team figures this out then we get this really clear sense of what the value of one edge is to another. It's like a nice conversion rate that we can just, it would be so valuable to us and to the entire ecosystem. Cause then that can drive future decisions, right? Uh, another question that we have that may not be a, you know, as big assumption, right? Is, Hey, if we change the CTA, if we change the card size, is that going to be uh, something that drives more engagement? Sure, that's something that we don't know yet and we're curious about, but is the impact of learning that going to be as valuable as this other learning that we want to have, right? So just to be super straightforward, experiments are your way to learn. Um, and you need to ask yourself and you need to ask your team and you need to work together to say, what do we want to learn and why? Out of those, what are the biggest assumptions that we have? and design an experiment that is fair and scientifically sound. Uh, don't make it super biased uh, so that you can actually run the experiment so that whatever you learn from it is actually true uh, and do it fast. So being an experiment driven learner is really uh, key to being a good growth PM. And then the corollary to that is, let's say you uh, create the best experiment ever and you know exactly what you wanna learn you need to be measuring the right things, right? So uh, if you have, if you uh, run your experiment and your engineering team and your design team have put, has put all this work into creating this experiment and you get the reads on uh, this conversion between follows and other follows, uh, you need to trust that what you're measuring is important and accurate of your entire ecosystem. So you can only measure your learnings if you have clear metrics and those metrics need to be accurate to measure your ecosystem. And you as a product manager need to be the owner and know more about that metric than anybody in the world, right? So some examples here of uh, North Star metrics. These are honestly, they're probably outdated, but it's just more to give you a slew. This is just, you could just Google and look something up like this, right? But every product, every company has a North Star metric within that company, every single team has their own within those teams, they're broken down continuously. So uh, it's really important to be measuring the right thing in the first place. We could do a whole course on that um, so that your experiments make sense and they're uh, valid and they actually give you the right learning. So being an experiment driven learner is really important uh, to just continue learning and then continue that feedback loop of being a good PM. So uh, yeah, any, any questions before we move on to the the final point. Yeah, so we have a, a question. So um, can you walk us through an experiment you ran before an experiment design basically? And mm -hmm. there's another part of that question. How do you prevent experiments from being biased? <laughs> yeah, got it. So the first one is, so the first part is more about like a, a example of the experiment. Is that right? Yep. Got it. So one experiment that we ran that uh, this is this is almost this is just like a very straightforward one. So we create new groups of recommendation pretty frequently. So things like, hey, people you may know who went to your school, right? Or hey, here's people you may know who uh, went to who work at the same company. Then we'll do some really interesting stuff like people you may know who also follow the same hashtag as you, right? So that's a more sparse signal and we're kind of guessing and hypothesizing that you may be interested in connecting with these people because they have the same interests as you. And you should actually only be connecting with people that you know, by the way, on LinkedIn, just FYI. Um, 
And so if you wanted to test how those two perform, right, a very fair, straightforward example of an experiment would be you have variant A that places that at the top, one, one variant, which is just people you may know from a company, variant B, which is people you may know who uh, attended your school, uh, you may even do like a multivariate and the third one could be the one that is uh, people you may know who had the same interests uh, and then make sure that the same amount of traffic is allocated to each of those and they're at the same exact position. All that stuff is controlled for. So controlling for other variables is probably the, one of the most important parts in uh, experiment design. Uh, and then, you know, let it, let it uh, uh, ramp it for a week or so and then read the results, right? So that, that's like an example of a very straightforward, uh, hopefully non-biased experiment. There's tons of other aspects to that where you have to make sure that there's enough power uh, to make sure that there's a statistically significant uh, result that you can read. Um, but you, know, you, can, you, can, you can look those up. They're, they're statistical uh, uh, principles at this point that are used in all experimentation. Um, and then to the second point, how do you make sure that you don't create a biased experiment. Yeah, it's really important because it's not, it's not usually that simple as the, the example that I gave before, which is just a matter of like putting two things up there. Um, I would say the most important thing about creating a, a non-biased experiment is making sure that you understand what other factors are already in place. So like what other experiments are running, uh, who you're making sure that you're targeting the right people, um yeah i mean it's it's a this is a tough question there's there's so many ways to uh to design a good experiment and there's even more ways to get it wrong but i think overall it's just making sure that you control for all the things that you could control for uh and then only change the thing that you you really want to measure um so yeah hope that answered that question because it's a tough one <laughs> any any others so we had one other question earlier um, mm -hmm. on one of your previous slides. Uh, can you share an experience uh, from your career um, where you were able to convince people with your data and you know the analysis that you had done? Yeah, so like just in general, being able to convince people with data and analysis? Sure, so um, I think one thing that is uh, really important in all of this is having a, <clears throat> Sorry, one sec. Is having very a very robust uh, product strategy, uh, which I'll actually be talking about in two weeks in another talk. So definitely sign up for that. Uh, so if you have a good product strategy and it is, uh, it drives the rest of you know your product roadmaps for the next year, two years. Um, you know that that's invaluable. And a lot of times, actually not a lot of times, you really need data to back up some of the um, ideas that you wanna pursue uh, in the future, right? So for us on the My Network team, uh, creating a strategy document inherently meant really just like bringing in all the data and all the experiments that we've run in the past uh, and using those to back up our uh, assertions and, and back up our ideas. And without those, there literally is no strategy doc. Without those, a strategy doc is just ideas on paper uh, that anyone can just type out. So um, yeah, I would say that that's like probably one of the most prominent examples I can think of, of when this is just super important and necessary uh, in order to, to just move your team forward and move your roadmap forward. Cool. Awesome. So uh, let's just get to the last piece, which is really ties in together everything. So um, being a gr good growth product manager, or just a good product manager in general, means you need to have crystal clear communication and specifically communication of your vision. So our uh, director of our growth team, Damien Kuyon, uh, I'm not sure if he's watching, but he has a saying, which is you need to be a cheerleader, cheerleader with a one string guitar. So what does that mean, right? So that means the cheerleader part is your energy. You're always, you're always there. You're always making sure that the message is out there. Uh, and the one string guitar is like, you should be able to recite your mission and the, the vision of your, your pillar uh, and your entire product space 
so much so that people get sick of hearing it, right? Uh, like a one string guitar, like that's all you're about. If everyone's like, hey, what is, uh, what's, the, what's the vision for the My Network page? Like, what's the vision for the, the notifications page? Like, they should just know it because you are a cheerleader with a one-string guitar. Uh, so for me, it's, yeah, help members build the right network. Uh, a couple other things I put here. I'm just guessing what some of these one-string guitars might be for some of these other teams. So if I'm the product manager for uh, Instagram Live, I would say my one-string guitars probably provide the best live experience for IG content creators. If I'm the PM for the growth team on uh, uh, medium, uh, medium uh, author insights, it's like, hey, I need to help writers understand their insights about their posts. If I'm an Airbnb product manager, my one string guitar just constantly playing it is give Airbnb hosts the best tool to manage their guest booking. So uh, why is this important, right? So it's, it's actually a two way street. So a, it's really important because you need to communicate your vision to other partners and other people on uh, other teams that you're interacting with so that they can clearly understand what you're doing and why you're doing it, why and how it fits into the overall ecosystem uh, so that they in turn can also uh, see how you fit to their, to their team, right? Uh, and you know, like product management is just inherently collaborative and inherently requires that you work with these other teams. Uh, and through working with other teams, you can find brand new ideas, right? Like really exciting ideas. Um, and so that's why it's really important for the one-way part. But the second uh, reason why it's so important is for you, really, to be honest. Like you cannot drive buy-in if you are not bought in yourself. So the more you do this cheerleading one-string guitar, the more you realize oh, actually my one string guitar isn't actually as crisp as I thought it was. Uh, I realized I don't even understand exactly why the mission of my product space is the way it is. And then you start refining it. Uh, so like the more you say it, the more you're cheerleading for your team and your vision, the more it helps you as well. Uh, so this really ties back to, the, to the, um, the first, the beginning slide, which is really understanding the why of uh, why your product space exists and how it fits into the overall ecosystem. So uh, yeah, any questions uh, before we, uh, I mean, the next slide is the key takeaways and wrapping up. So yeah, any, any thoughts on that? Um, go for it, uh, Andrew. I don't see any questions as of now. Cool, awesome. So to just bring it all home, um, you know, we define what a, growth, what a growth team is, what a growth product manager is, uh, and again, it's really worth just doing your own research on that because there's tons of really exciting stuff written about it. Um, lots of lots of good growth uh, uh, minded people to follow on Twitter. Uh, really cutting edge stuff. So the really the key four the the key four key takeaways of this is to be a good growth product manager, you need to be a good ecosystem thinker. And I put here a couple of questions you can just con constantly ask yourself because um, that's really one of the best ways to sharpen your thinking, right? Is just continue to ask yourself questions. How does my work contribute to the ecosystem? Where are the lever levers and opportunities that I can pull to drive most impact, right? As an ecosystem thinker, you're always thinking about this. You're not just thinking about your own space. You're thinking about the whole thing. Second point, being a data-driven decision maker. What data do I have to back up my thoughts? What, what data don't I have? Um, and how do I get that data, right? Um, and how can I make decisions based on that data? And how confident can I be in my decisions based on that data that I have? The more uh, sound data and salient data you have, the more confident you can be in your decisions. More data doesn't mean more confidence. You could, be, you could have just a bunch of noise and that actually makes it worse. So just being really crisp about the kind of data you have is really important. Uh, third is, oh actually, third is actually experiment driven learner. Uh, I should add uh, being, yeah, I should add that as a third point, but uh, asking yourself, what do I want to learn? What's the biggest assumptions that I have and how can I learn fast and quick from thoughtful experiments? How can I make sure that those experiments are designed in a way that actually provide me with the learnings that I want to have? Uh, and then finally being super crisp about communicating all this to your own team, to your broader team for yourself. What is that one string guitar that I can play uh, and I can recite in my sleep? Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, those are, those are the four key takeaways. There's a lot more that makes a product manager, a good product manager and a growth product manager, a good one. Um, but for me, these, uh, these four have been really valuable and I hope you can 
you know, add them to your own toolkit of product management. Cool. Uh, Thank so you guess, so much. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So we have, uh, we do have some uh, other questions. Uh, yeah. One of them is, do you have any insight for being a growth PM in a startup rather than an established business with solid processes and culture? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, I'll first preface it with that. I haven't been a growth PM uh, at a startup before, uh, just uh, at LinkedIn, but uh, just based on what I um, just like talking to people and in, in the, in the space and, and doing a lot of reading. Um, actually, this goes back to the, let's actually just go to this funnel view again. So, when you're at a startup, it's the, the growth phase is really focused on this acquisition and activation, right? Like you're trying to get as many people to use the product as possible. You're trying to get as many people engaged in the product uh, and activated so that they're actually in it, in the product in a meaningful way and not just, you know, you, you sign up and then you drop off. That doesn't count as activation. Like you got to have some kind of metric that's, uh, I think for Facebook, their activation metric when they were first starting out was like, once you have five friends, then you're like activated. I think for Slack, it's like uh, 10,000 messages or something like that, right? So at a startup, which usually implies that they're, they're trying to grow, uh, acquisition and activation are probably like one of the most important things. Uh, at a later company like LinkedIn, we're still definitely, definitely uh, concerned and uh, focused on that. But uh, retention is actually a big part. So that's where my team, the My Network team comes in, where we're retaining members by making LinkedIn so valuable to them that they keep coming back, right? So the more you connect with people and interests, your feed becomes more valuable to you. Your network becomes more valuable to you. And so that's a retention phase. So that's usually the, the dichotomy between the two, but there's a lot of nuances for sure. Cool. Any, okay, any so uh, there's one other question. Um, cool. Does my uh, does uh, my network um, in LinkedIn does it have a regular product manager as well as growth PM or just growth PM? Yeah, good question. So we actually have mul um, so the 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 pillar as a whole, the my network pillar is under the growth team as a whole. Uh, so we are all technically growth product managers, but we'll have a lot of integrations with other teams that aren't part of the growth team that do directly affect uh, the My Network experience. So that's a long, that's a long winded way of saying that uh, there's both and yeah, there's both. Let's leave it at that. Cool. Uh, if there's, if there are no more questions, I think I'm Good to close I think out. that's it. I don't really see any other questions. Um, thank you so much, Andrew, for spending time with us and, you know, yeah. doing this remotely. We really appreciate your time. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to go through like a couple more. Um, well, Slide. so he's asking, there's, there's another question. Um, how has the COVID pandemic affected your ability to manage your team? Any difficulties with managing remotely? Yeah, yeah really, really good question. Um, you know, honestly, like with each of these slides, I, I had different, there were almost like bullet, po bullet points you could add about the whole COVID <clears throat> situation for each of these. And I almost like deliberately didn't try to address it. Um, but what I'm trying to get at is that it, is, it basically affects like every part of uh, the product management flow. But if I had to put it succinctly, uh, I would say that it has just made things a lot more um, focused on, it's like, you know, you, you, you hop on a call to have coordination and it's about getting that problem solved or like completing that task, right? Uh, really good for that. It's really efficient in that way. But the things that are severely lacking are the hallway conversations, right? So, uh, and other things that are similar to hallway conversations, which are, uh, the ad hoc, passive, uh, not no intent having uh, decisions that can be made by just bumping into different teams. Uh, you know, you 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 bump into someone who's on the LinkedIn Premium team, for example, right? Uh, when you're when you're going out to get lunch or something, and, and then you just have a chat, and then an idea arises. So there's less of that serendipity, 
uh, which, which is usually what makes the product management experience uh, a little bit more colorful and adds a little bit more uh, fuel to ideating and uh, coming up with exciting ideas and things like that. So that's definitely lacking, but um, it's kind of hard to tell actually still what the, uh, what the impact is just because we're like so in the thick of it. It's kind of like being in the middle of a storm and then, you know, asking someone to say like, hey, what's it like to be in the storm? You're like, I don't, I don't know. I'm still in it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like that for everyone right now across the world. And so, you know, we really want to, um, yeah, we're really grateful and definitely be, like thinking of everything that's going on. But, but yeah. One cool. last question. Uh, what are some of the skill sets that a growth PM can bring you know and uh to an interview that that basically brings them an edge yeah um so i'm assuming this person who's asking is interviewing right now i would say like like even not even con counting interviewing having just quantitative rigor whether it be doing like these small exercises like where you're just constantly sizing things like i'm looking at my desk right now I have a clock and I'm just like, okay, how many clocks are being made, you know, in America? like just these little exercises, just having that sharpness that comes with doing growth product management is just helpful in, in, in everything I would say. And definitely helpful in an interview when, you know, they're asking about impact and metrics and things like that. So just being structured and thinking and having a, a structured quantitative mindset uh, in your back pocket is super valuable, I think, in any, in, in just like life, really. Yeah. 